Sam Kenny used to be a vegetarian. Now he's one of Australia's leading butchers, running six very fancy butcher shops in Melbourne's most affluent suburbs. The Kenny experience is a beautiful fit out, a nice uh, shop aesthetically, super clean, super organised. Ideally, I mean, look, one of the goals for us is that it doesn't smell like a butcher shop. I told you they were fancy shops. It's the award winning small business big marketing show, thanks to American Express. <laughs> I said, welcome to a small business marketing show, a success for small business owners share their souls, to take your marketing straight to the lead, now here's your host, Mr. Tim Bowie. And welcome back to your weekly dose of marketing skullduggery. I'm your host, Tim Bo Reed. You, infinitely more importantly, you're a motivated business owner and you're ready to crank out some great marketing to build that beautiful business of yours into the empire it deserves to be. Today's 435th episode is made possible thanks to American Express and to see how you can turn your existing expenses into some seriously good rewards, Google Amex Business after the show. Speaking of show, it's a big one today. Fancy Pants Butcher, yes, Fancy Pants Butcher, Sam Canning shares how he's successfully disrupting a very staid industry. Listener Danielle shares the success she's having from implementing two ideas from this show. And this week's Jingle of the Week, well, it'll either put you off milk forever or make you love it forever. As per usual, team, there is marketing G-O-L-D dripping from the ceiling over here at Small Business Big Marketing's HQ. So let's get stuck right in. Okay, let's meet Sam Canning who was a vegetarian before becoming a celebrated butcher. His experience in paddock-to-plate butcher shops in the UK inspired him to open his first shop here in Australia with a focus, believe it or not, on animal welfare. In 2010, the first Cannings butcher shop was opened in the leafy Melbourne suburb of Hawthorne. Now Sam has six shops, And let me tell you, they're not your average butcher shop. They're quite beautiful. And he's in the process of opening up two more. This rapid growth hasn't come without some pain, which Sam talks about. Plus, he shares how he's gone about cleverly disrupting a very staid industry in butchery, if that's a word. I started off by asking Sam why he gave up being a vego. (laughs) Um... Look, I think that was just inevitable working in the meat industry. Um, but look, I don't know. I think probably, I don't know, maybe I just forgot about where meat comes from for a little bit and, you know, just let the, uh, just let it, I don't know. Maybe I wanted to forget it. I don't know. <laughs> Clearly. How, how old were you when you became a carnivore? Oh, look, you know, to be honest, I still don't eat a lot of meat. Um, don't I tell think, anyone uh, that. No, I know. Look, I think, um, you know, everybody's uh, everybody's a little bit different. And look, I think I thrive without meat, but um, uh, but there's something I couldn't give up, and I couldn't give up bacon. I just uh, oh, hello, I hello love, bacon. I love bacon. I love bacon. But you know, I can't remember the last time I had a steak. Honestly, it's been that long. Is that weird? So it, it sounds weird coming from a high end butcher who makes a living from selling meat. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> Um, I don't know. You just got to listen to your body, I guess. And yes. as I said, it's it's not something that, that that you know. I don't really crave it. I mean, I, I don't, you know, once again, I crave bacon, but uh, you know, it's uh, and I love beef burgers. But aside from that, you know, I'm kind of a bit, you know, whatever. Let's have a quick romantic bacon discussion, Sam. What's your favourite bacon? Well, you know what? I mean, look, our bacon is absolutely awesome. Like no the doubt. bacon that we that, that we make ourselves, it's um, you know, it's quite smoky. Um, but I'm actually loving at the moment a dry cured bacon, which we buy from uh, a local uh, producer, Provador, uh, Pacton Park. Uh, they're up in Echuca, and they uh, they do a dry cured free range bacon. Right. Um, and it's uh, yeah, it's preservative free, and it is absolutely awesome. It's like herby and a little bit peppery, but it's like. 
you know, it's the belly bacon, so streaky bacon. Um, and that's, I'm actually, you know, we're smashing that at home at the moment. Um, my kids are eating about, you know, eight packs of it a week. But uh, wow. we, can, we can kind of do it a little bit sort of, you know, more guilt-free because, you know, it's it's uh, it's it's preservative-free and it. um, nitrate-free. And um, But, yeah, look, once again, don't get me wrong, our bacon is absolutely killer and, um, you know, that's the best seller in all, all of my stuff. So this is the problem with bacon. We can't stop eating it. We can't stop talking about it. This is a business show, <laughs> Sam. I want you to focus, focus. Look me in the eye. Now, where the idea for for running your own butcher shop come from? Well, firstly, my dad was uh, a, a businessman himself, and uh, he was in he was in marketing, but he was sort of in business for most of uh, well, you know, well, a lot of his sort of professional career. Um, so I think that that kind of that kind of um, entrepreneurial spirit is kind of hard coded into yes. you. So um, you know, I sort of just went through a lot of my sort of early. Uh, years as being a butcher as being you know quite sort of unsatisfied with just the day to day and and the sort of the core the basics of, of mm-hmm. the job itself I do love butchering but um, you know it, it comes it comes to a point where in, in any sort of industry I guess that um, you know you feel that you've paid your dues you've been doing it for I don't know ten years you feel like you're quite confident you're quite good at your craft and it's like what's next what's next and so I kind of got to that point and I was I was actually thinking that I didn't like the industry and I was you know looking for I guess ways to get out of it and kind of I was at a bit of a, a crossroads I guess you could say and I'm not sure mm-hmm. which way to go and I went on a big overseas holiday uh, around the world uh, by myself for about six months and it was during that time where um, you know I had a bit of a I guess epiphany and, and I, I uh, love a good epiphany Sam where were you and what was it just to go hard and you know try and make something of this uh, this career that I've you know mm-hmm. invested in so, so part of that epiphany was it simply to s- tell you to get back to Australia and start a business or was was canning's butcher shop part of that? Um, no, I think. Look, the epiphany was: Hey, uh, you don't you don't hate the industry, you don't hate the job. It's uh, you, you want to be in control of you know, I guess your own destiny and in control of. I know everything I'm saying here makes it sound like I'm a control freak, but I'm actually <laughs> I don't think I am anyway. But uh, I, I'm guessing you are, and I'll just make a mental note to come back to that. Describe for us Cannings, because most of us haven't been there. I've introduced it as a high end. Is it a butchery butcher shop? But it's pretty classy. So, what's the Canning experience for someone who hasn't been? The canning experience is a beautiful fit out, a nice uh, shop aesthetically, super clean, super organized. Ideally, I mean, look, one of the goals for us is that it doesn't smell like a butcher shop. Uh, you know, it's got a sort of fresh kind of smell going How on. How do you quite, do that? It's full of I don't know, dead just, meat. Just, Good, good. Uh, I don't know. Good cleaning processes. Lots <laughs> yeah. of fresh air going through the place, and right. um, most of the shop, shops are pretty new as well. So we've got that in Bit our of favor. Pot-puri. Uh, yeah, a bit of pop puree, but um, fairly young staff, high energy, good music, positive culture, um, and then there's the you know high welfare, grass fed uh, produce that we we have like our own sort of selection criteria, which is quite strict, um, and you know so we're actually putting in a lot of time and effort into uh, you know where we get all of our produce from. Sam, just just going back to the experience, they're, they're beautiful shops. Beautiful. Yeah. Um, how, did you have someone come in and design them, or did you? Is it all off your own bat? Well, the first one, no, because everything was done on a on a, on a shoestring. Uh, so we didn't have an interior designer, and I was sort of just, uh, I guess, you know, designing the shops myself. But and winging it. Tell, can tell, and you can tell. But um, the second shop we did, um, yeah, I got an interior designer, and we did the full, um, you know, the full, uh, I guess, you know, styled concept, and um, and you know, we've developed that even further over the, over the years. But I mean, it does kind of all have the the, the similar concept now. So let's break it down. What you've just described to us, because mm-hmm. that is, it is not a standard butcher shop. I, I was in our pre-interview, I suggested that you have challenged your industry, which I love. Mm-hmm. Your response to me was, I didn't realize. As I was, which I found a little bit astounding, because everything you've done, you know, if you put a if you put a, a standard fifty year old butcher shop next to Cannings, mm. they are vastly different beasts. Excuse mm. the pun. So, mm. did did you not did you not uh, overtly sort of go through the conventions of butchery and say we're going to do the opposite, or is it just played out that way? Yeah, I think it has played out that way a little bit. I mean, I'm. 
<clears throat> I guess that's one of the benefits of having your own business is you get to just, you know, do things the way that you like. Before I opened the first store, um, my dad and I, you know, he, he helped me sort of develop, I guess, the brand a little bit um, and and what our sort of our key points of differences were. Which so, were, so how did he do that, Sam? How, how did your dad help you develop the brand? Were there certain questions that he asked or certain things, uh, exercise he took you through? Yeah, look, probably, but I can't remember exactly what they were because it was it was about nine nine or so mm. years ago now. And um, but yeah, look, my dad and I were workshopping quite a bit of stuff as well as you know a lot of the uh, local kind of demographic data of Hawthorne because Hawthorne was where the first shop was. You know, there's the logo and the name. What do we call it? And then there was like you know the key points of difference. Uh, and I think at the time where it was it was all natural, it was free range and um, uh, hormone free, grass fed, hormone free, that kind of thing. Um, and then. Yeah, so look, a lot of it was just around, it was quite simple, I guess, in terms of, you know, it was all about the just high welfare produce. Um, and, you know, that's where it was all really sort of So, so from. fundamentally, the foundation of Cannings is high welfare produce. Is that what you, is that where, and everything else kind of came from that? And if so, what does that mean? That's, it's, it's a deep question, the whole meat ethics thing. But, um, but yeah, look, put simply, um, you know, beef that hasn't been, in a feedlot, beef that's been, you know, grass-fed for its entire life, beef and lamb that's been grass-fed for its entire life and hasn't gone into a feedlot, um, accredited free-range chicken, accredited free-range pork. Um, but just going a little bit further than that and, like, meeting farmers, actually going out to, the, to our producers and, and, and seeing their establishments and going to the abattoirs and stuff like that. And that's still something that I do today and it's something that is sort of more regimented in our um, canning selection process mm -hmm. uh, or selection criteria. So, so everything you sell at Cannings, Sam, someone, you or someone else has gone yep. and checked out how these yep, animals me. are being treated. You. Yeah, me personally, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. And, and not, is that something you overtly use in your marketing? Yeah, it is. It is. We've got a new website coming out next week, and it's it's sort of a little bit more front and center that that kind of uh, philosophy. Um, uh, but yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it is. I am talking to Sam Canning, a fancy pants butcher. I call you Sam. <laughs> fancy pants. <laughs> fancy I do have pants some pretty butcher. nice pants on at the moment, actually. You see them. Uh, thanks to American Express. Now, um, again, going back to how you've challenged the category. So beautiful store, food, well, uh, meat and, and desserts. Funnily enough, well presented. You got a bit of blueberry crumble. I notice in there. Yeah, um, that's right. You got to wash down the beef somehow. Uh, um, w what else have you done in terms of – butchers have always, I would argue, been pretty good at customer service. They've been very welcoming. Mm. Uh, yes. Sort of they, you know, they're, they're a fundamental part of any local community. How, how do you do that? Um, look, it was easier when I was actually doing it personally. Um, when I had uh, just the one store being being Hawthorne, um, yeah, I mean, that's how I built the business. I spent, spent a lot of time on the counter um, and I've never been good with names or I've never been as good with <laughs> names as uh, as when I started up my own business and I, would just, I was just remembering everybody's name and just have it, building a really good relationship with everyone and um, yeah, it's a bit harder now though because I don't spend uh, any time on the counter at all because we do have six stores and um, yeah, spending, uh, spending time on the counter is quite hard is that um, frustrating um look it was initially but to be honest with you it's um it has been quite a while and it's sort of you know my role has changed a lot over the over the years and um yeah i don't you know i don't think about it as much as i used to it used to really bother me um mm. not having the time in the store Which, but, it's really um, the only it's reality I've, now i've heard it a lot i mean i had a painter a commercial painter uh, on a couple of years ago the minute he stepped off the tools stopped painting buildings and worked on quotes, client liaison, follow up, all that kind of stuff. His business his business quadrupled literally within mm. a couple of months. Mm. Um, and it's a funny part of small business, isn't it, Sam? Where you go into it. I mean, for you, you loved butchery. Uh, for the painter guy, uh, his name was Taz. Actually, Taz Mullis. Uh, he he um, he loved painting. But there's a point in business where we started because we loved something, but now that love is growing, so we've got to step away from it and focus on more mm. almost administrative slash strategic kind of tasks. That's right. That's right. Yeah, indeed, indeed. And look, the business, I must say, uh, no business can ever be really as good as it can be without, you know, like a retail business I'm, I'm talking about. Mm. But I mean, you know, the, the, the front man or the front person of the business, you know, just really driving it. It can never be as, as, as strong as, as, as that 
moment. But um, yeah, look, all of my managers, um, they've got a amazing sense of ownership they really do treat the place like their own and um yeah i couldn't ask for for much more out of uh, out of my management team they're, they're doing such a great job this show is made possible thanks to american express business explorer credit card a card that lets your business expenses reward you i asked amex member chris gray ceo of property buying business your empire how he benefits from using his amex I use Amex for the whole of my business. Literally every single thing I pay in my business, even down to effectively my staff or my contractors and my rent at home, everything goes on the Amex card. Because with Amex, you get the most points for your dollar spent. And I convert those points into frequent flyer rewards points. I fly 10 or 15 times a year, only business and first class, including those beautiful A380 suites you get on Singapore Airlines where you get your own bedroom. And I fly for free. I don't pay for a single flight. But it's not all upside, or is it? So I've got, a, I've still got a million points because I spend so much money in my business. I've then got to pre-plan ten trips for next year. Of where do I want to go? I need to find excuses to go to different countries. <laughs> this is a massive first world problem, Chris. It is, but I'm willing to put up with it. So there's there's very few people that can uh, can force themselves through the pain barrier, but I'm willing to do it. I've trained myself. <laughs> New American Express card members who apply and spend three thousand dollars in the first three months from the card approval date receive a bonus one hundred thousand membership rewards points. Ah, uh, you got to love it when your business expenses reward you. Search Amex Business to find out how. New American Express card members only. Offer ends November 30, 2017. Terms and conditions apply. You've had some pretty decent growth. You've got you've got six stores now in six of Melbourne's leafiest suburbs in you're you're 8 years old. Um mm-hmm. wait, can you pinpoint the moment where you thought, "Hang on, this is working." Mm. Um, well, look, uh, to put it into perspective, it was 2010 when we opened Hawthorne. Um, I was, you know, there with that one shop, building that up until 2014 before I took the next opportunity. Um, and then it's pretty much just been one every year after that. What, what's been what's been the hardest part, Sam, of br- bringing canning cannings to market? Yeah, look. You know, I'm probably not unique in saying that 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 people and 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 culture is is <laughs> is, is a hard one to not um, unique at all. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not. I mean, it's not like I'm pushing pushing it uphill all the time. Mm. Um, you know, I feel like we're in a really great spot at the moment. Um, but just that moment, it, it you know, there is that that moment when when the owner kind of has to step uh, out of the you know the daily operations of the business, but you still need to try and uphold all the values. It's like. Um, you know, it's all these these um, these values that I've uh, how do you do in, that? How do, I've got in, I've got in me, and I need to kind of instill it amongst the other uh, across all you know the whole group. How do you do it? Um, look, we have a lot of I guess just a lot of meetings, a lot of talking with with the staff. Um, you know, a lot of documenting now. Like I guess you know it's become. Uh, I guess we've become a little bit more corporate in that regard. You know, you do have to kind of document all these kinds of things and put it all on paper. You know, because mm-hmm. Because it does get hard, it does get harder and harder to communicate it. And you know, we're we're six stores, six stores in now, and about a hundred staff. And you know, my my values have sort of, you know, they've come to this point where they kind of are something that that that, that is kind of on paper, and you mm-hmm. kind of need to, I don't know, explain it to people because um, it is different. Like I'm not in the store with everyone, and people can't. There's not there's not that kind of grafting thing that goes on when the owner is in the one shop and everyone else can just observe the owner and see, um, you know, uh, what what yeah, the yeah. values are. So you've got a, you, you're finding your way around six stores now and trying to do mm. that on a, on a fairly regular basis. I was talking to actually a past guest only last week, Felicity Rogers from Cargo Crew, which is an interesting business that's challenging the, all the conventions of the the corporate uniform industry. Um, she's seen huge growth over the last couple of years. You know, gone from a handful of staff to thirty or forty staff. They have a meeting every morning, literally. First thing, nine o'clock, everyone in, 30 or 40 of them. Um, just a quick update. Any, anyone can talk. Someone facilitates it. They share the facilitation of it. Just a way of connecting. A bit harder for you because you've got six stores. They've got one. 
That's but, amazing. I would love to do exactly uh, exactly that. Um, we've got a head office now, and we actually do that within our within our head office. Um, mm. But yeah, in, when you've got the you know the retail thing and multi store kind of thing, it is it is harder. It is harder. It's amazing, mate. You talk, you know, you you have become very corporatized in a in a you know six <laughs> stores. Does that does that sit comfortably with you? It does actually. I'm, I must say, I just maybe I was born for corporate life or whatever. But it's, I mean, it's not super corporate. But I mean, you know, we do have the head office structure thing going on, and I'm quite office uh, office bound these days. But I love it. I love planning. I love strategy. Um, I love organising things. Uh, always have, and I still get to do all of that. Uh, so yeah, I just I'm just not cutting me. Bit of a control freak, Sam. <laughs> no, no, no. Just like oh, organising, well. that's all. Oh, of course. <laughs> Of course. Hey, yeah. Uh, let's let's talk a, a bit more, well, a bit more marketing. Let's drill down on the marketing of Cannings yep. because there's some things you're doing that are finding quite interesting. You have managed to get the whole Cannings brand down to one word, and I don't hear this very often from business owners. I think it's very clever. What's your one word? And break it down for us. Um, so the one word is care, uh, and essentially the philosophy around it is uh, if we care about every little step of the process all you have to do is give every little bit of process a bit of care and um and everything is going to be uh everything is going to work out fine when i say every bit of the process it's you know it's your workmanship it's how you treat your customers how you treat your staff if there's care in every one of those little steps then you know i i just feel that you know with a bit of care uh nothing can really go wrong i like that where'd that come from where'd that idea come from that's something you'd read in a marketing textbook well, yeah. Look, I am going to sound like Dad. a bit of a you know a bit of a copycat now if I uh, if I tell you. But um, uh, no, I got it from um, uh, well from uh, the Rockpool, the Rockpool philosophy. Oh, yeah. um, and I think I read that on a, uh, on, a, on, a on a on an in-flight magazine. And um, yeah, Neil Perry uh, was in an interview, and and he had um, I think his mantra was also care or something very mm-hmm. similar. And it just really resonated with me. I'm like, holy hell, that is like that is perfect for mm-hmm. us. And um, yeah, that's um, that's like that's what we go by. And and really, that is care for the customer. It's care for the animal. It's care for the farmer, the supplier, the staff. It's it just every every aspect of the Canning's business. That's right. That's right. Good mate. Yep. It's clever. Yep. Mm, so, mm. Uh, real estate strategy. Talk to me about that. You are in again. This is a global show, but uh, you are in Melbourne's. Most affluent suburbs. You're in Kew. You're in Ivanhoe. You're in Hawthorne. You're in Armadale. Uh, Malvern. Malvern. Yep. Jeez, mate. You know you. Uh, mm. what, what again? What's the thinking there? Sounds obvious, but why? Oh yeah, look, it kind of is obvious. Um, obviously, what comes with a with a high welfare, free range, premium product is a is a is a price tag that kind of reflects that yes. kind of uh, that kind of product. And yeah, so look, just so happens to you know that we have to be in those suburbs to sort of be able to to get that 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 premium. Now, don't get cross with me, Sam. I get my. I'm gonna I'm gonna figure out how expensive you are now by this simple simple little formula. Um, I buy my eye fill it. Oh, he's going to kill me. I don't even, I, I'm not going to say this. Okay, I'll say it. Big breath. What do you pay for? <laughs> I get my eye fill it from Coles and uh, it's thirty nine ninety nine a kilogram. Yep. How are we going so far? Um, well, look, on face value, we're not going too well. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but no, look, there's different grades, I guess, that would be on the, on the supermarket shelf there as well. And look, you can get good meat from the supermarket. They do have some salt, select kind of... Um, lines you know mm. grass-fed premium kind of stuff yes. but um yeah it's 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 not really an apples for apples kind of situation come on uh, how much is your eye fill at a kilogram don't avoid it uh, i'm not sure i should know shouldn't i, <laughs> uh, no, it's a, I think we're, we're we're i think we're low to mid 60s yeah but i think you'd find that you know comparing apples for apples and like we trim all the you know the silver skin off the top i think you'd find it's pretty similar and um yeah look um you know, that's interesting I, I bought a um I bought, I don't know even what you call it, but a slab of I fill it from Aldi the other day. See, this is just getting embar- embarrassing. I know I'm going to get a whole lot of, you know, Timbo the tight ass. Um, but um, someone said, no, no, you got to get the I fill it at Aldi. It's really good. But there was, it was actually all, you just called it silver skin. Sorry to all you vegetarians yes. listening, but um, it was yeah, very silver. tough. It was very average I fill it, I must say. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think a lot of the time where the supermarkets let them down is um, is just the aging process. They really do rush things through, and they'll, you know, with with red meat in particular, they um, uh, it ne- it needs age. It needs minimum two weeks, uh, right. ideally about you know four weeks of, of aging before it's ready to eat. And you know, supermarkets will just buy it one day and sell it the next, and it's just not ready. 
Um, so it could just be something as simple as that. But what's, um, yeah, what's the best marketing you do for cannings, Sam? Oh, you know what? I, this is something we we've been doing for years, and I just think it is the best marketing avenue of all time. And that is, um, it's SMS. It's um, yeah, it's text, text message. We've got a um, fairly large uh, database of SMS, uh, or sorry, of mobile numbers that um, that we've acquired over the years, where our customers uh, have opted in to the to the program. And yeah, we text them uh, weekly or fortnightly, just with with specials. And uh, it's it's just it's so good. I mean, everyone's phone is you know within about a meter of them at all times. So. Um, we do quite a lot of different things, but you know the text message is just that one thing. It's just straight to the customer, and um, I just don't think there's anything better that and better than that. And it's um, you know it's pretty cheap as well. So. I think that's genius. How are you capturing the mobiles? Um, how are we doing it at the moment? Look, we do a lot of um, uh, because we you know we have the, the, the face-to-face thing over the counter, so just a lot of communication mm-hmm. mostly uh, over over you the might counter. Might grab your that. mobile and send you a few specials every now and then. Well, yeah, well, we put like, we'll put a little card in their bag or something like that, and then they um, they do it when they get home. But um, you know, I, I reckon that's one of the, one of one of the best things one of the best things ever. Um, well, you know, it's an we- idea. I mean, you can imagine how many times I ask that question. Uh, SMS marketing does not come up come up often, and I and I think it's very clever because, as you say, your phone is always with your person, generally mm. speaking, throughout the day and night. Um, mm. And I don't know about you, but I don't get a lot of a lot of marketing come through my phone. I don't think, yeah, look, I think it's a, it's a bit of a hard sell, I think, you know, because people don't want to give out their mobile numbers um, mm. willy-nilly. So I think it's, it, you really you really do have to have a, a relationship with, well, you know, you've got to have a... I know a, what you're a, saying, Sam. Yeah, yeah. Many would a, a friendship or something yes, friendship. With, your, with your customers. And, yeah. um, you know, not, not anyone's just, you know, I don't think anyone's going to let Aldi, you know, <laughs> Get on. Now can well, you give well, mobile number? We, we laugh, but Aldi is Australia's most trusted brand uh, for 2018. Wow. Yeah, I know. So wow. maybe we, we would give it to Aldi. We might not give it to Coles. Who knows? Yeah. We can mm. keep thinking about that. Coles, tell tell Coles me about already have it. Correct. Correct. <laughs> um, School of Butchery. What is it and why is it? Uh, School of Butchery is uh, it's a series of uh, one night courses that we that we run out of our Q store uh and basically there's you know there's different there's different courses there's a lamb night there's a sausage night there's a night that we call a canning's apprentice which is um you know we we do a lot of little things basically people can buy tickets from the we teach me website and um yeah i guess it's it's an event that we that we that we hold at the uh, at the Q store yeah why uh, why why is it um not sure. Bit of fun. Um, <laughs> just let 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 people see what we do behind the scenes. Um, there's a bit of mystery, I think, behind it. And um, you know, us, is, us is butchers... it good for business? Is it a way for you to give back? Do you get staff out of it? Is there any sort of strategic reason for doing these? Uh, what are they called again? Uh, School of Butchery Nights. Yeah, look, um, without sounding bitter and jaded about it, I don't, I don't think there's any good that comes out of it aside from <laughs> it's honestly, it's not a money spinner. It's it's so hard to run these nights at a really good price point. Right. It's 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 hard for us to make money even when they're incredibly expensive. Like they, they are quite expensive. I think you know uh, they they sort of average around three hundred to four hundred dollars a night per person. Mm-hmm. But they're just they're just great fun. And um, how many do you yeah. get along to one of those nights? I think we do, we ca- we cap it at about eight. Um, some of them are capped at six, depending on. Um, so that's about two and a half grand, say two grand a night. Um, yep. How are yep. you not making? Well, not it's not huge dollars, but why aren't you making yep. money? For, how can they? How can they cost you money? Oh, look, I think a lot of a lot of it is just down to the the, the cost of the materials that we have to you know work with, with being meat. Um, it, it's expensive. Um, we kind of. We can't use, you know, what gets uh, what we work on. Essentially, um, you know, we we cook a bit of food, we serve a little bit of wine, um, we hand out, you know, the the knives. We give the customers the or the um, mm-hmm. we, the guests. We give them the knives and, and things like that. So I don't know. It just adds up the staff, um, etc. We've got to pay our staff to, to be there, and I don't know. It's just one of those it all adds up scenarios. Yeah, you, see, you sound pretty bitter and twisted about it, Sam. I think we probably let it go. <laughs> Write a, mem- write a memo after this interview. No, no more school of butchery. 
No, nah, but they're selling out. Like they're they're, they're selling out. We 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 actually the limitation for us is is actually finding the st- our staff who are prepared to do it because it's a Saturday that we we host them on Saturday nights and we actually run out of um, staff who are who are able yeah, to host okay. them. Mm. Fair enough. I, I I may be a bit behind the time, Sam. It wouldn't be the first time I have been called that a bit slow, but looks like butchery is following the same trajectory as being a barber. Uh, barbers have become very cool again. You know, we're seeing them pop up on every street corner and in between. They're offering an incredible experience. I had a, a fellow from a barbers on the show only recently, a, a barbers called Scumbags. Fantastic <laughs> experience. It's where I get my hair cut. But um, again, what I'm seeing in, in the land of butchery is we've got the traditional butcher shop. We've got these, I've got a sort of, I've got a half fancy butcher shop near me, but it doesn't go past sort of just the presentation is like a little bit better than the standard butcher shop. And then you've got butcher shops like Cannings. You're sort of seeing an industry that's really starting to change right in front of your eyes. Yeah, absolutely. I'm seeing yeah the next generation kind of come through, and um, yeah, there's some really great ideas and concepts and stuff coming through, and um, yeah, and, and unfortunately, it was kind of you know forced upon the meat industry by the by the supermarkets who are taking control of the the yes. industry quite a lot and and running a lot of the smaller operators out of out of town in a lot of places. But yeah, look, we always open up next to a supermarket. It's that's part of our business model to be near Clever. a supermarket and yes. and just um, uh, take them. Well, not really take them on, but I mean, we're just not really worried about. It. Like, you've got to have them there for the for the foot traffic. You know, people are thinking food when they're at the supermarket. Of and um, you're selling. Uh, you've got six retail outlets. You you've got an online store. Is there? W- w- what do you see the future of butchery being? Is 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 it is it online? Uh, look, I think online's got potential to have yeah a lot of growth. Um, we're investing quite a bit in the online space uh, at the moment. Uh, we've been doing online for about four years, and it's pretty good. Um, but it's nothing like it's nothing like retail, like you know, bricks and mortar kind of retail for us. But so, can you imagine Cannings having twenty stores around Australia in the next ten years, or can you imagine that? reducing and having a much stronger e-commerce presence depends which day you talk to me actually about (laughs) that (laughs) because yeah um not lately though i haven't had any uh any any thoughts about uh you know sort of downscaling and just going into the online space although i have thought about it and thought oh how fancy free and, and how easy would that be just to have an online store and not have any retail stores but no i haven't had haven't been thinking that way for for a while now and um but having said that no i i look I, I'm I'm not sure about the uh, the interstate expansion, twenty, thirty, forty stores mm-hmm. across Australia. It's not, I, want a, I want a simple life that I can you know manage and yeah. I, I don't need that 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 uh, that crazy kind of scale in in my life. I, I don't think. But Fair hey, enough. don't quote me on yeah. that. I might change my mind tomorrow. <laughs> what, what's your what's your work life balance like, Sam? I'm re- I'm reckoning it's pretty good. It's really really good. Yeah yeah. It's um I work four days a week about. Three or four months ago, I, I made the decision and I gave myself permission to not work on Fridays as well as Saturdays and Sundays, and um, that's been probably one of the best things I've ever done. Uh, and I, you know, I basically get Friday to, to you know, spend on myself because um, obviously Saturdays, uh, Saturday, Sundays, uh, quite sort of family orientated. I've got two little kids. So what's Friday look like? Oh, Friday is um, spending time in my recording studio or taking my motorbike out for a spin. What are you um, recording? Podcast? I'm not. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, at the moment. But uh, no, nah, look, I love recording bands. Um, yeah, recording rock bands, basically. And, That's uh, brilliant, buddy. So you're taking that Friday off, that decision, because again, a lot of business owners listening to this going, how? I could never do that, not in a million years. Did you take a hit financially to do that? Uh, no, no. Uh, look, I think the um, the head office structure, as that sort of developed and developed. Look, we've got about eight people in the head office at the moment, and I'm just at that point where it kind of doesn't really matter where I am at any one particular point in time now. Um, as long as I can answer a phone call, respond to an email, awesome. keep the the wheel spinning, because um, I'm not really a part of any sort of day to day kind of stuff anyway. So it's you know it's de- it's decision making mm-hmm. and um, and you know conversations and strategy is what I do, and um, you know they don't need that on a Friday. Good uh, and a good decision. So you see, obviously yeah. better you're better off for it. 
Your wife's mm. probably loving it. Kids are loving it. Yeah, yeah. He's a, yeah, he's no, a better it's... bloke, the old man, now that he has Fridays <laughs> off. But no, look, I completely understand, you know, the, the, the trap that sort of, you know, we all fall into. And um, look, if you're working in a retail kind of thing and you're part of the um, the manpower, then you don't have a choice. And I totally get it because I've, I've done that. But um, yeah, I think, you know, as, as we went into that sort of head office uh, structure, it's, I don't know, it's just... I'm not really missed, so yeah, <laughs> That's it's awesome. A great thing. Hey Sam, I think it's a great story, mate. I I wish I could get down to a Canning's Butchers in my old hometown, but uh, alas, you'll have to open one in Noosa if that's going to happen. Not out of the question, well, being Melbourne's most northern suburb. So uh, who knows? <laughs> uh, people can find out more if they want to online. What is it? Canning's Free Range Butchers. That's a quite a long domain name you got yourself there. No, no, it is, but um, yeah, no, the, the shorter version of that is just canningsbutchers.com.au. Why have you got canningsfreerangebutchers.com.au? Is that a bit of an SEO keyword rich play? Well, no, that's that's the business name. The business yes. name is Cannings Free Range Butchers, and um, yeah, look, Cannings is the uh, is the, the shortened, more URL-friendly version. Yeah, clever, mm-hmm. clever. <laughs> well done, Sam. Great story. Uh, all the best for the future. Thanks, Tim. Well, there you go. Fancy Pants Butcher, Sam Canning. Now, be sure to hang around after my top three attention grabbers, which I'm about to share with you as listener Danny shares her marketing secrets and wins big in the Monster Prize draw. But right now, my top three attention grabbers from that chat with Butcher Sam Canning, thanks to our mates at American Express. Attention grabber number one. I just simply love that Sam's challenging the industry in which he works. You know, it's a state industry. It's a very old industry uh, and it needs a bit of a tickle. And Sam is doing just that. Attention grabber number two, SMS marketing. Genius. I don't know about you, but my phone is not full of businesses trying to get me to buy from them. So I think there might be an opportunity. I don't want it to be full of either, but I would argue that there is a bit of an opportunity there, and clearly it's working for Sam and Canning's butchery. Attention grabber number three, documenting systems. Now, Sam's a relative, well, it's not new business, but he's got six stores. I love the fact that he's documenting all the systems and processes in his business. It'll make it more valuable if and when it comes time to sell, and it just makes running the business a whole lot easier because if someone doesn't show up, a system's documented and you're in good shape. That's what grabbed my attention. Head over to smallbusinessbigmarketing.com forward slash 435. Let me know what grabbed yours. Come on down. It's Timbo's Monster Prize Draw. Oh, yes, indeedly, doodly. It is that time of the episode where we reward a motivated listener for taking some swift action. I want to hear from you. What idea have you learned from this show, implemented, and what impact has it had on your business? If you do that and I read it on air, you win some prizes. Righto, today's winner is Danielle Rathman from Heartbeat Handicrafts. Well done, Danielle. And this is what she sent me. She says, hey, Timbo, firstly, thanks for the great content and interviews you keep rolling out. My journey into small business is relatively new, but I'm so excited about what's ahead. I like that. I started Heartbeat Handicrafts in 2015 with the encouragement and comfort of doing it alongside my sister, who also started selling handmade accessories at the same time. Good to have a buddy to work along, I reckon, when you're building a business. You can whinge to them. You can hug them. You can high five them when you've had a big win. Danielle goes on to say, I pretty quickly identified some of my knowledge gaps, well done, including marketing. Now I am mainly running Heartbeat Handicrafts and only working as an occupational therapist one day a week. Because it's a long drive to the OT job, I use this time to binge listen your podcast like that, which gives gives me a huge surge of motivation and I don't feel the days wasted away from the business. When I get home, and I like what Danielle's doing here, I scramble to write down all of the marketing gold that I feel I can get stuck into straight away or that I need to think through further. Great idea. You know, this show and other podcasts like it, you know, we give advice that is implementable immediately, but there'll be some other big ideas that you go, hmm, I need to mull over that. That's a good thing. Danielle goes on to say, I have been able to start putting into action several of the ideas, but only I'll only mention a couple in this email. One of the key messages that kept coming up was that a product or service needed to solve a problem 
or personal pain point for a potential customer. I couldn't identify what this was for my existing range because I was selling mainly handmade earrings, which in my view is more of a luxury than a need. That's Danielle saying that, not me. I realized that I did actually have my own personal pain point in relation to the products I sold though. I would tend to lose or break earrings when traveling because they would just be thrown into my makeup bag. This spurred on the development of my fabric earrings travel pouches. That's genius! I found this new product line, then made it easier for me to start making short videos because I had something to talk about now that I had a product that was helpful for customers. That's exactly how it works, Danielle. I am also now a huge fan of building relationships. I collaborate with local artists by making earrings featuring their artworks. This has been successful because customers who already liked the artist's work but didn't have space for a whole canvas or couldn't afford something large had the opportunity to buy statement earrings from me instead. Both the artists and my business benefit from the exposure to each other's social media followers. Thanks again, Timbo, for the content you're creating. Kind regards, Danielle Rathman. Heartbeathandicrafts.com.au is where you will find Danielle's work. Well, thank you, Danielle, for listening and most importantly for implementing. And as a result, you have won a bathroom essentials pack from past guest Saya McDermott. That includes some special potions and lotions valued at $79. You get a pass into the American Express Lounge at Melbourne or Sydney International Airports. That's valued at $33. And you get a backlink on the Small Business Big Marketing website, which is priceless. Now, I'd love to hear from you. I'm running a bit low on emails from listeners who have done something as a result of listening to this show. So send me an email, tim at timreed.com.au. That's R-E-I-D. Telling me what it is. Keep it simple. Keep it short. If I read it on air, you win some prizes and go into the prize draw to win a hot lap with Bathurst winner, racing car legend, past guest, Steve Richards. That is worth entering for alone. That's the Monster Prize draw for another week. Righto, it's time for the advertising jingle of the week. This one's from 1981. And as a young, hot-blooded Australian teenager, I was 14 at the time, it triggers some very, very fond memories. Memories that we don't need to go into any detail on this show. It's a family show, but fond memories nonetheless. Now, the ad is for the flavoured milk brand Big M. It's set on a surf beach where there's plenty of young guys and girls in their bathers running around having a lot of fun. The problem is, though, when the girl tries to drink the milk from the carton, it runs down her front. I don't know, possibly an issue with the packaging. Who knows? Who knows? Anyway, here's the jingle. Milk will never be the same now the big M's here. There's a big strawberry M, big strawberry M. Oh, every time I hear that, it triggers some childhood memories. Is 14 a child? I suppose so, some childhood memories. Good memories nonetheless. You can watch the ad over at smallbusinessbigmarketing.com forward slash 435. Well, that almost wraps up another episode of the Small Business Big Marketing Show, sponsored by our great friends at American Express. Search Amex Business to find out how your business expenses can reward you. Hey, I've got some great interviews coming up, including one on mental health for small business owners, a chat with a fellow who's selling merchandise for small businesses through vending machines at Officeworks, and he's doing some other amazing stuff as well. He's met Richard Branson. He's got the Prime Minister coming to his office tomorrow. I've already done the interview. It was a great story. And in a few weeks' time, you and I will be masterclassed in SEO tactics for 2019 by one of the world's leading experts. So be excited. Be very, very excited. Don't forget there's an entire back catalogue of interviews over at smallbusinessbigmarketing.com. If you love the show, then tell another business owner about it. Please download it on their phone. Do it today. Three a day for a week. It's 21. Tick that box. Until next week, I am Timbo Reid. Thanks for tuning in. May your marketing be the best marketing. Bye for now.